Today, the former president of the United States asked the Supreme Court for absolute immunity from charges connected to his attempt to overturn the election he lost. Not granting him that, he warned, would be, quote, the end of the presidency as we know it. Continuing from his brief, quote, as the recent history of impeachment demonstrates, once our nation crosses this Rubicon, every future president will face de facto blackmail and extortion while in office and will be harassed by politically motivated prosecution after leaving office over his most sensitive and controversial decisions. Now, we should point out here that this has never happened to a former president before this one, and there's no evidence it's happening now to him. Yet, that dubious idea, which a lower court unanimously rejected, is now central to a sweeping invitation for the court to set precedent for generations to come, a call for overturning the common sense notion that no president is beyond accountability, something the founders certainly believed. And two centuries later, Senate Major uh, Minority Leader Mitch McConnell gave as his reason for not holding the former president accountable after January 6. We have a criminal justice system in this country. We have civil litigation. And former presidents are not immune from being accountable by either one. Well, unless, of course, this former president gets what he wants from the Supreme Court. More on all of this now from CNN's Evan Perez, who joins us now. So what stands out in this filing, Evan? Well, Anderson, this is designed to appeal to the conservative justices who have this expansive view of the power of the presidency. I'll read you just a part of what the Trump lawyers say in this filing. They say a former president enjoys absolute immunity from criminal prosecution for his official acts. Criminal immunity arises directly from the exec executive uh, vesting clause and the separation of powers. Uh, they go on to say that the impeachment uh, judgment clause uh, reflects the founders' understanding that only a president convicted by the Senate after impeachment could be criminally prosecuted. Of, of course, obviously, uh, Anderson, that, that is referring directly to that, uh, that, that episode that you just uh, played from Mitch McConnell, which is, uh, you know, during the impeachment proceeding, the Trump lawyers uh, argued that you could leave it for the criminal justice system to take care of this issue that the, pre the president was being accused of. Uh, and of course, now they're, op they're arguing the opposite. They're saying that, first, you have to be impeached and convicted by the Senate for, b before you can actually take any kind of criminal action against uh, the, the former president. Uh, this, uh, th this argument also, uh, Anderson, is designed also to, to remind Brett Kavanaugh of some of his own writings. They point out that in the past he has pointed, pointed out that uh, a president who was concerned with being criminally prosecuted is inevitably going to do a worse job, it's designed again to appeal to that core conservative group on the, uh, on the Supreme Court. And is it clear when Special Counsel Jack Smith may respond to this? Yeah, the Supreme Court has already set those deadlines. Uh, April 8th is when uh, the government is due to, to respond. Of course, uh, there's going to be another uh, set of filings after that. Uh, and then the oral arguments are set for uh, April, uh, uh, April 25th. And we're anticipating that, that uh, Jack Smith and his team uh, are going to go back to the thing that you just opened with, which is that no president, no one uh, under our system is supposed to be above the law, which is what President uh, Trump and his, uh, former President Trump and his legal team are arguing here. Evan Perez, appreciate it. Thank you. Joining us now is former Republican Cong Congressman Adam Kinzinger, who served on the House January 6th Committee, also CNN legal analyst uh, Jennifer Rogers, and Maggie Haberman, senior political correspondent for The New York Times. Um, Maggie, uh, let, let's start out with you. I mean, first of all, what do you make of this latest filing? Not a surprise. No, it's a continuation of an argument that they've used several times, perhaps more emphatically right now. I think that the Brett Kavanaugh writing is very intentionally done. Um, you know, we know this is a former president who has talked repeatedly in private about being unhappy with the Supreme Court justices who he appointed because they haven't sided with him in his election lies previously. Uh, Brett Kavanaugh is somebody who came under a lot of scrutiny and a lot of attack during his confirmation process, and I don't think that that's a coincidence that they're using this. But look, they are looking toward oral argument, and they are looking toward how the justices are going to respond to it. And it is not especially concerning to them that, as Evan noted, they are taking contradictory positions. In one filing, they say, um, you know, well, he wasn't impeached. And then in another, they say, well, the criminal justice, during impeachment, they say the criminal justice system is where this should be dealt with. I just, I don't think we can underscore enough how consequential Mitch McConnell's speech was that day, not because he was so hard on Trump, but because of what he chose not to do, which was not to vote to convict and not to whip other Republicans to do the same.
And uh, Jennifer, I mean, Trump's lawyers, I want to read uh, what he said. Let's put it on, on the screen. He said, if their lawyers said, if immunity is not recognized, every future president will be forced to grapple with the prospect of possibly being criminally prosecuted after leaving office every time he or she makes a politically controversial decision. That would be the end of the presidency as we know it and would irreparably damage our republic. What do you make of that? I mean, what do you expect the Supreme Court to, to do here? Yeah, well, except that this has never happened before. No president has ever faced that, that concern before because no other president has done this before. Um, you know, listen, I think that the court is going to look at his argument for absolute immunity, which is the argument that he has to make here, right? He can't really make a more nuanced argument about, well, all of these things I did were part of my official duties as president, and therefore I should be protected in the way that he could if he, say, ordered a drone strike and some DA somewhere tried to prosecute him or something. What he did, he did as a candidate for his own personal benefit and his political benefit, not for his job as a president in the country. And that's why he has to go big on this argument for absolute immunity. And he has to raise the specter of, oh, if you do this, you know, everyone's going to be prosecuted after this. Well, no one has been prosecuted before in the history of our country. No one who lives within the bounds of the law while their president will be prosecuted again. This is really about his actions. And because those actions are outside of any reasonable scope of what the president is supposed to be doing, I think the court will have to set a standard that is below absolute immunity for sure. So, and Congressman, I mean, if former presidents can't be prosecuted, why did Gerald Ford pardon Richard Nixon? I mean, also by the, the Trump team's logic, every president could go on a crime spree the last morning of his term and Congress wouldn't have time to impeach convict, so he could never be prosecuted. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's its logical conclusion. You could do that. A president could form a militia. He could, you know, order the military to overthrow Congress. Like there's any any number of horror stories that we can think of a president could theoretically do with absolute immunity. And the only way he would ever be left out of power is if he failed at his illegal action. If he succeeded, of course, he'd just stay in power at that point. So the logical conclusion of this is, I mean, I, I don't think there's a chance in the world the Supreme Court finds in favor of Trump. But the other thing I ask is, like, let's do what I literally just thought of uh, and created the Biden test, okay? So if you add, if Joe Biden could do what Donald Trump is saying he wants to do, would that side believe that immunity would exist? For instance, when they argued that a president could, in theory, have SEAL Team 6 go after his political rival, uh, are they saying Joe Biden could do that? Well, of course, they'd say no to that. And so everybody has to be held to the same standard. If the Biden test doesn't pass, then there's no way that the uh, uh, that Trump should be able to get away with what he tried and did. And Maggie, Trump's lawyers, they invoked the drone strikes by President Obama, um, Middle East airstrikes launched by President Clinton around the time of the Monica Lewinsky uh, scandal as examples of conduct they thought could be could have been prosecuted. And then they write, in all of these instances, the president's political opponents routinely accuse him and currently accuse President Biden of criminal behavior in his official acts. In each such case, those opponents later came to power with ample incentive to charge him. How the do you Biden interpret example is really strange, considering that example about Biden is being made primarily by Trump and by people connected to Trump. Um, what they're trying to say with the President Clinton and President Obama arguments is basically that there is no such thing as an official act that isn't political, that you can't divorce one from the other. And I expect you will hear them make a version of that before the Supreme Court. I don't know how compelling it'll be, because mm. when they tried going down this road in the lower court, one of the questions that came up was, you know, what if there was a, a ordering seal, a SEAL 6 team to go assassinate a political rival? And that got into a, a cul-de-sac that I'm not sure the Trump lawyers wanted to be in. And so you can argue yourself in one direction or another here, but I don't think that, you know, any any rational person thinks that drone strikes are the same. And they will try to suggest they were because he was talking to his vice president, but there is so much else that comprises what he's been indicted for in connection with January 6th. And Jennifer, the Trump team also floated this idea that if um, the Supreme Court refused to grant him full immunity, it, the case could be sent back to the lower courts. How, how much would that delay things? Yeah, well, if they did what he wants them to do, it would delay things substantially, which is go back for some sort of factual finding and application of the new test to this case and then come back up on appeal inevitably. But they don't need to do that here. You know, we're not at a stage where there's factual findings to be had except for the trial itself. They have the indictment. At this stage of the game, the indictment is taken as these are the facts we're working with. And they have the law, the Constitution, as they're going to evaluate this immunity argument up against the Constitution. So the lower courts can't do anything more 
more than they can do, in other words. So there's no need to send it back for anything other than the trial itself. And that's, that's what his argument is missing. He wants another spring back and forth to delay things a number of months again, really, till next term in the Supreme Court. But the Supreme Court won't fall for that. There's no fact-finding to be done. And, Congressman, I mean, it's important to point out that there is a lot at stake here in this ruling. Oh, there's a lot at stake. I mean, not just in, in terms of what it means for this election. I mean, obviously, if the Supreme Court comes back with what they expect, we expect and say you don't have absolute immunity, uh, then potentially this trial will proceed. But it has a huge deal of at stake if they come back and say there is such thing as unlimited immunity. I, I don't see how the presidency and, frankly, how democracy can continue if you have a bad actor in place that literally can get away with anything so long as he or she has the title of president in front of their name. And uh, so this is a very important thing for the Supreme Court to take up. It may be why they decided to take this up after the, uh, after the appellate court, but um, they're going to have to make their stamp. And hopefully it comes out 9-0, potentially 8-1, but it's going to be a resounding defeat for Trump, I think. Uh, Adam Kinziger, thank you. Jennifer Rogers, Maggie Haberman as well.